Today we're going to talk about one of the greatest constitutional challenges of our time. It is a question that brings into, uh, it's a question that revolves around individual freedom and liberty. This issue is going to be paramount to the next uh, congressional meetings for the next several years and probably the next several decades. It will define how broadly the federal government can move its powers and make us all either purchase products or not purchase products and what activities we can actually engage in. My name is James Woodruff. I'm a professor here at the school and president of the Jacksonville chapter, lawyer chapter of the Federal Society. Along with Chris Saba, who's the president of the student chapter, we'd like to welcome you as we present Doug Van, uh, Vandal from the Cato Institute. He's going to talk to us about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Now, the individual mandate is what the key focus has been at the court system over the last year. There's been five decisions that have come out from different judges across the United States that have determined whether or not the act is constitutional. Two of those judges have held it's unconstitutional, three have not. What we have seen from the three judges who have held it constitutional, and most specifically the last judge, is this belief that physical activity is not required, that merely mental activity is all that is necessary in order to regulate and force you to purchase some product from another private individual or corporation. And that's wildly different from the previous law regarding the Commerce Clause. Now, Doug Bandow is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He has a JD from Stanford and has been a special assistant to President Reagan during the Reagan administration. This gentleman has appeared on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and has also graced the pages of many journals and newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal and Fortune magazine. With that, I would like to welcome Doug Vandal to Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate uh, both James and Chris for having me in. It's a great pleasure to be here. I actually went to Florida State University, so I have a connection to Florida, though in those days I didn't get uh, farther, uh, much to the east, uh, you know, after from my studies. But uh, you know, I, I love getting back to Florida, and especially to talk about a topic like this one, because it really is a very important one. And if you, uh, you know, think of policymakers in Washington, they have a lot on their plates right now. You know, the president's thinking about Libya and the possibility of military intervention. You know, Congress is trying to sort out the budget, and they have a you know, short-term uh, you know, a spending bill, they have to come up with budget cuts, we face a huge, you know, amount of spending and debt in the coming uh, you know, years, a lot of other issues which are pressing down on everyone. I think the President and certainly the Democrats in Congress had hoped that at this point, roughly a year after passage of the landmark legislation, they'd be done with health care. That it would be over, everybody would accept the fact that it was passed, and they could get on with implementing it. But what we find is, that's not the case at all. The issue remains very controversial, remains very heated, and remains under challenge. And healthcare is a critically important issue. It's about one-sixth of the U.S. economy, so it does have a huge economic impact. It's also very important for us from a personal standpoint. I mean, I, most of us, I think, you know, value health. I mean, you know, health matters in terms of your ability to enjoy life. And if any of you, you know, have struggled with uh, the challenges of an elder relative, you know, with health problems, you understand how utterly <coughs> difficult and at times very emotional you know, health care issues are. And it doesn't matter what the system is, <clears throat> who controls it, how it's run, those kinds of wrenching decisions are always going to be there. You know, there are no simple answers in terms of how one tries to fix health care. The legislation that was passed was roughly 2,600 pages long. It was made more complex by the fact that Republicans, you know, gained a blocking 41st senator, uh, you know, in the special election in Massachusetts, which required the Democrats to kind of play some procedural games and essentially accept the uh, Senate legislation that was passed because they couldn't run it through again. But a very complicated piece of legislation. It has individual mandates, which is the most important issue in constitutional terms, but it also has employer mandates, it has insurance uh, regulation, it, you know, it says states are supposed to set up insurance exchanges, it expands uh, you know, Medicaid, it has cutbacks on Medicare, it creates several new programs, including one for long-term care, 
Now, a very complex piece of legislation. When the Congressional Research Service was asked, how many new boards and commissions will have to be created as a result of this, its response was, the answer is unknowable. Who knows? I mean, this is going to be played out over a number of years in terms of implement, implementing this act. Indeed, much of the uh, you know, requirements don't even come into effect until 2014. One of the ways that uh, the majority kept the costs down, at least the perceived costs down, was they start collecting money now, but they don't have the expensive requirements come in for another four years. So that way they can say a six-year cost is a ten-year cost when it comes to government accounting. So they can sell it as a, a $1 trillion program. Now the promise was they could simultaneously expand coverage, cover more people for more things, cut costs for health care, and cut the deficit. Now it's fantastic if you can come up with a way to do that. I mean, Washington is kind of filled with people who seem to believe they have pixie dust in their pockets, which they can kind of sprinkle around, and, and you can do contradictory things. The challenge we face is that you know, there's no easy answer on health care. If you expand coverage for more procedures, you increase demand for those procedures. You increase demand for those procedures, well, that means you spend more. Well, how do you try to you know, not spend more becomes very complicated. And that's where the legislation is at. <clears throat> Speaker Pelosi you know, said that they were going to pass the bill so we could find out what was in it, which I thought was a very interesting way of looking at the, the passage of legislation. And we've started working through that with the implementation of the act. And what we're seeing, I think, is the challenge that it poses. We're seeing insurance companies drop uh, you know, policies that, uh, for young people because of the, the way the requirements play out, that they can't get their money back. We're seeing premiums rise. We're seeing concerns over federal spending. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening. And all of that's on the policy side. It's not the legal side. But it's important because it plays into the political challenge. So where we're at on the legislation is there are kind of two different challenges that are moving forward in tandem. And one of them is the political challenge. The Republicans took control of the House of Representatives in the election last November. So they passed what is largely a symbolic vote, but nevertheless, you know, an important symbolic vote. Was, you know, one of their early uh, you know, votes was simply to repeal the legislation. Of course, it passed the House. Now, it didn't you know, go anywhere in the Senate. But you know, suddenly we have one body of the national legislature that's very much against this piece of legislation. And indeed, almost at war with it, it's going to raise issues in terms of funding. You know, they're battling over funding right now, a funding bill, but the question is, do they, can you stop pay, you know, basically stop funding for implementing the act? So we're going to have a political challenge. It will continue. It's going to run through the 2012 election. The Republicans are very likely to pick up the Senate, probably not get 60 votes to break a filibuster, but they'll probably regain the majority. That will give them kind of accelerated you know, interest in trying to challenge the act and the question of what happens with President Obama. Is he reelected or not? So you're going to see this big political challenge that's going to continue irrespective of the legal side. But the constitutional challenge is also very important, in part because it plays off of the political one, which is if you're a judge, you know, if you're a you know, judge during the New Deal, you know, you perceive that if you're standing athwart this legislation that's strongly supported by the political process, very dangerous for the judicial institution. But today, if you're a judge, you might say, well, you know, I feel fairly free in terms of making a judicial ruling, because obviously this legislation isn't terribly popular. So it's not as if I face, you know, the roller you know, kind of the steamroller coming at me, that indeed I can decide if I want to toss it out, I'm not going to be overwhelmed by the political process. So judges may feel a bit more free, and my guess is they're going to want to make this decision fairly quickly, probably the 2012-2013 term, because in 2014 is when so many requirements kick in. This is when it makes sense. Get it decided one way or the other before the legislation really pops in. Now what's interesting is, you know, in Washington, Basically, you know, legislators don't think about being constrained by the Constitution. A number of legislators, Speaker Pelosi and others, were asked, where is your authority under the Constitution to pass this legislation? Speaker Pelosi's response was, are you kidding? You know, I mean, the, the notion that, the, that they actually you need constitutional authority for Congress to do something seems <coughs> more. And several other of the leadership had the same kind of reaction. You know, it doesn't really matter very much, uh, you know, the uh, majority whip. Uh, you know, Clyburn said, well, most of what we do isn't in the Constitution anyway. You know, I mean, what you found was you know, pretty much dismissive of the idea that this was very much of a problem. But we're seeing well, the fact that we've gotten two district court judges to say this exceeds Congress's authority, I think, shows this is actually a serious challenge. Initially, the administration hoped to just kind of dismiss it, say it wasn't very important, it's all kind of silly, we all know that this is going to prevail. But I think now the recognition is these are very serious cases. We're going to moving to the appellate courts later this year. 
it's going to be very interesting to see how they turn out. If you look at partisan composition so far, the Democratic judges have sustained it, the Republican judges have overturned it. It'll be interesting to see what happens as it moves on to circuits. Does that partisan complexion still have an impact or not? You know, we're looking at circuits for Florida, Virginia, you know, D.C. was the most recent one. Gladys Kessler was a D.C. Uh, you know, judge. So it's going to be very interesting as this moves forward. I think ultimately we'll definitely go to the Supreme Court. Very, very hard to predict you know, how this is going to turn out. The most important challenge is on individual mandate. You know, the question is, does Congress have the authority, does it have the constitutional power to require you to purchase insurance? And that, you know, that bit of the legislation really is the key to the legislation. That's what the administration has argued in the lawsuits. That was what was argued when the legislation was being passed. Because there's a huge amount of you know, regulation of the insurance industry, and most important in terms of community rating a, rating a guaranteed issue. I go to insurance companies and I tell them, you must take anybody who comes forward, and basically you can't engage in underwriting. That is, you can't decide certain people are bigger risks than others, and they kind of come up with narrow bands as opposed to allowing very wide pricing you have today. If you're going to do that, you've got to mandate that people buy insurance. Otherwise, people will game the system. They found that in Massachusetts. You know, that what happens is you wait till you get sick, and then you show up and you buy insurance. And you use the insurance until you get well, and then you drop the insurance. They found in Massachusetts there's a lot of you know, short-term use. Now they're trying to deal with that by having an open enrollment period that's limited, and only that period for you to you know, get on the insurance forms. You know, so the idea of the mandate is to say the only way we can effectively have all this regulation on insurance companies is to require that everybody use insurance. Well, can the federal government mandate to do so? And the, what's critical here, I think, is to recognize this is a very different power from states having auto insurance. And even setting aside the question about, you know, you basically you want to drive on the roads, this is a requirement, states have police power. And we've long understood states have a different set of powers than the federal government. Theoretically, the federal government is a government of limited and enumerated powers. Congress is supposed to do what it is said to do in Article 1, Section 8. That's its list of powers. It's not a general federal police power, but rather a list of powers that it's supposed to be able to do. What does it fall? Where, where do we kind of reach for the power to go out to individuals across America and say, you must buy insurance? Well, typically, you know, what Congress does today is just as the commerce power. I mean, in essence, commerce power has become Article 1, Section 8. I mean, all these specifics don't really matter much anymore because everything is considered to be commerce and everything that is commercial is considered to be interstate. Therefore, Congress can do whatever it wants under whatever circumstance. That's been kind of the traditional notion. The problem here, of course, is that in this case, you aren't doing anything. And this is, I think, to me, why it becomes such an issue. You know, is it really commerce, the fact that you exist at home, and you, know, you have not entered the insurance market, you have not bought anything, you're not a farmer, you're not growing anything, can then the federal government, in the name of regulating commerce, come and mandate that you enter into it? I mean, the famous case, Wickard v. Philbrook, the wheat case, of course, this is a farmer. Now, he was growing you know, uh, crops primarily for his own use, but he was growing crops. He was busy. The more recent case is the Raich case, the medical marijuana case. And again, these are people who are growing marijuana. Now, the argument was they're only growing it you know, internally, they're growing it just for their own use, for you know, medical purposes, not interstate. But they were still had entered the marketplace for marijuana. They were growing it, they were acting, they were doing something. So you can, you can understand how the connection is made in terms of the regulatory process. So the question then is, you know, here people are engaged in the very activity that is being regulated. And the argument simply is they may be doing it intrastate, but it affects the interstate <coughs> regulatory system. So we can reach them. Even though the fact they're only doing it within the state, they're still, they've entered that marketplace, their activities are affecting the system. Now, I tend to think that you know, the aggregation of what's an impact on interstate commerce in these cases is, is a little bit uh, dubious. Nevertheless, it's an understandable step. I mean, there's a logic to it. But could you imagine if in the case of uh, Wickard, the federal government had said, you know, our problem is we don't have enough wheat being grown and enough people buying wheat. So really, they wanted to raise prices for wheat farmers. So we're going to mandate that everybody in America has to grow wheat. So we're going to determine how big your garden plot has to be, depending upon how big your you know, lawn is. And we're going to mandate that you go out and buy bread every week to increase the demand for wheat. Now, could the federal government have done that? I think that's really the question we find. 
It's one thing to go to wheat farmers who are wheat farmers and say we're going to regulate your activities. It's quite another thing to go out there and say, good news, you are going to become a wheat farmer. And I would argue that's in essence what is being done with the insurance mandate. That you have not entered this marketplace, but we are going to make you enter this marketplace. Now I've had it, you know, some of the critics of this say, well, the court has never really dealt with this issue of action versus non-action before. You know, so this is really a new argument. This is kind of an extreme new argument, judicial activism. Now, my reaction is the reason the court hasn't dealt with this is because until now, the federal government, even the folks in Washington, couldn't really imagine doing something like this. I mean, I, can't, you know, I suspect if you had presented this idea to FDR and said, I have a great idea. Let's make everybody in America become farmers. Even he would have said, oh, whoa, that's, that's a little extreme, you know, kind of a little intrusive. I mean, it's a little rather a substantial step for the federal government to go. That, you know, the reason this has not been litigated, has not been a big issue, is because for the most part, most people wouldn't imagine doing it. Because it really is a step much further beyond. That we're not, you know, you have not, sub you have not done anything normal to subject yourself to the regulatory powers. Instead, we're going to kind of push you into, you know, the marketplace. You know, the case of Wickard, I mean, it talks about promoting economic <coughs> activity. I mean, they want to kind of you know, pull back his production because they want to have higher prices, they want more economic activity. Well, but of course, all those same arguments could have been used in terms of bringing in non-producers into the marketplace. Again, does the federal government have that power to suddenly make you enter that marketplace and we regulate you in that regard? And the administration is trying to redefine then what uh, you know, activity is about. Because they understand that this you know, looks rather serious. I mean, are you engaged in activity or not? If you're not engaged in activity, what are we regulating? Kathleen Sebelius, the HHS uh, secretary, you know, says, well, you're making an economic decision. So it's an action. I mean, a decision is effectively an action. Judge Kessler, the DC uh, you know, <coughs> court judge, who recently put out the opinion, said, you know, that her, her decision, I mean, the Commerce Clause applies to mental activity, i.e. decision-making. So suddenly decisions have, been the, have become the equivalent of economic activity and commerce. Now, this is really an extraordinary step. I mean, you sit in your house and make a decision, and this is considered to be the same thing not to, or at least equivalent to in constitutional terms, actually engaging in commercial activity. She said that you know, the difference between action and a decision is of little significance. It's just formalistic, as she put it. You know, individuals are actively choosing to remain outside of a market for a particular commodity. So if you choose to remain outside of a market, it's the same as entering the market. I mean, now this, again, is kind of, you know, what do words really mean in this case? Well, we're, we're kind of flipping the meaning around. I mean, normally we think of not entering into a market means we haven't entered into it. But now it turns out if we choose not to enter, and maybe if we're forced not to enter into it, maybe it doesn't count. But if we choose to enter into it, it's as if we choose, if we choose not to enter into it, it's essentially the same as if we choose to enter it. But how can, how can that be the, the same thing? I mean, much of the law is based on formalistic, you know, distinctions. A lot of things in the Constitution are rather arbitrary. I'd be 35 years old to be president. Well, why 35? Why not 34 years and, you know, 11 months? Well, I mean, it's formalistic. I mean, does this matter or not? Well, there are reasons why. You want bright lines. The Supreme Court itself has said that much of the Constitution is concerned with setting forth the formal <coughs> requirements for our government. And traditionally, the courts have invalidated measures deviating from that form. I mean, the form matters. If you're going to have the law, if you're going to have the Constitution, form does matter. And there's a difference between kind of economics and commerce, and there's certainly a difference between decisions <coughs> and activities. Now, the traditional test, <coughs> you know, is I think, think of other areas of the law. We normally treat very differently whether you actively do something or don't do something, even if there are similar consequences. I think, for example, the criminal law. I mean, one case is you show up with a non-swimmer in a pond, and you push them in and watch them drown. The other one is you show up at a pond, you see a non-swimmer fall in and they drown. <clears throat> now, we might view you as being equally morally reprehensible, but for the most part, except in specific cases where some states have passed you know, special laws in terms of, kind of good Samaritan laws, you can stand there and watch somebody drown. That doesn't make you a murderer. Now, if you push them in knowing they can't swim, 
suddenly we can hold you accountable for murder. We make very important distinctions based upon whether you act or don't act. And it matters. And again, one can argue that maybe these are arbitrary, but frankly, they're very important throughout life in making those kinds of distinctions. And again, I ask the question, could the federal government show up and say, we all have to become farmers? I mean, it's not just that. It's not just the question of growing crops or having to go out there and buy you know, food. Imagine where this principle leads. You know, there's a problem in the U.S. auto industry, so the federal government can mandate that we all buy General Motors automobiles. Your failure to buy a GM automobile is a decision by you not to enter the General Motors marketplace, which has led to the collapse of a major industry in America, which has required a bailout, it's required higher welfare payments, it's had enormous impact in terms of people leaving Detroit and fleeing to other states, and it's required a federal bailout with enormous economic implications. Presumably, I can mandate that you buy GM automobiles. We have a problem on Wall Street. Lehman Brothers is in trouble. Well, we can mandate that you purchase Lehman Securities, because your failure to purchase Lehman Securities is a decision not to enter that particular marketplace which has had enormous economic consequences. Just look at all the bailouts we had to have back in 2008. I mean, you can kind of run down the list. Florida real estate. The fact you all haven't bought condos in Miami is why all the condo market is bad, right? If all of you had been forced to go buy condos in Miami, maybe the market would still be inflated. I mean, kind of run down the, you know, the list. You know, what could the federal government not require you to do if it has this power? Now, again, the, some critics say, well, yeah, that may be true, but this is not the best limitation, you know, kind of the activity, non-activity, in terms of power. It would be far better for the Supreme Court, if you want to limit government power, to pull back on this kind of aggregation of economic impact, where you don't assume the mere fact you do something, even if it's economic activity, impacts the rest of the country. And I say that's right, but that doesn't, you know, tell you whether or not inactivity is commerce. I actually think that it would be nice to limit that aggregate test, but that's a completely separate issue. The critical question as we come back to is, does regulating interstate commerce mean the federal government can regulate a failure to enter the marketplace? It's fine for me to have two tests as opposed to just one that limit you know, federal power. Indeed, if you look at what the uh, you know, framers wanted, and if, you, if they had imagined a situation where people would be asserting that the national government they were creating could go out across America and mandate that people engage in an economic activity, indeed engage in an activity of buying private products, they'd be horrified. I mean, they, the Commerce Clause is primarily a mechanism to break down state barriers to trade. They wanted to expand trade. The notion that it becomes the tool to regulate and allow the national government to expand its power is completely separate from what they wanted to do. Now, you know, Judge you know, Kessler said, well, you know, the fact that you know, one can come up with this parade of horrors really is irrelevant. You have to look at the case in front of you. Well, it's true, except the parade of horrors helps inform your understanding of whether or not your principle makes sense. I mean, if you have a principle applied to a, a constitution that creates a government of limited enumerated powers, and the parade of horrors tells you there are no longer mighty limits, that suggests you have a problem with your principle. That what your principle is doing is essentially obliterating a very important limitation of what the national government was supposed to do. I mean, it's interesting, there have been two cases over the last decade or so in which the Supreme Court has stepped back from the abyss on the Commerce Clause. The Lopez case, which is, you know, guns near schools, where the court said, no, you know, we're not going to let the national government prohibit that. And also Morrison, which is a question of violence against women act, a <clears throat> question of liability, where again, the court said, we're not going to let the national <coughs> government go there. In Lopez, Chief Justice Rehnquist said, even Wicker, involved an economic act in a way that possession of guns on a school zone does not. You know, they said in Lopez that, yeah, we understand with the, the litigants here that the national, you know, the supporters of the law are saying, if you, if you pile inference upon inference, we can see how you make the argument of kind of aggregation of impact in state commerce. But we're not going to go there. We decline to go there. They said it would be hard to posit any activity by any individual that Congress is without power to regulate if you pile those inferences upon inferences. They explicitly, explicitly refused to convert Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause to a general police power of the sort retained by the states. They felt that it was very important to say the constitutional system at some point puts a limit on what the federal government can do. Those limits may be fairly thin these days, but they are there. 
And I would argue in a case like this, that's another one where you've got to say this is one of those places where they are there. In Lopez, they said, some of our prior cases have taken long steps down the road that would essentially eliminate you know, the, the commerce clause, any kind of commerce clause limits, but we decline here to proceed. But they kind of looked into that constitutional <laughs> abyss and said, well, that if you step over this line, there really isn't much left of a limited enumerated powers. <clears throat> now, one can argue, what's the best way of limiting the federal government? And again, is this <clears throat> the best way? But that's really not the issue. The issue is, what does the Commerce Clause allow? Is this commerce? If this isn't commerce, you know, if the decision not to enter the marketplace is not the same as actually entering the marketplace, then Congress lacks the power under the Commerce Clause to mandate individual purchase. Now, one of the other arguments is, well, there are lots of mandates in the Constitution, you know, or at least lots of mandates in law that have survived constitutional challenge. There's military conscription, jury service, you're supposed to fill out your census form. But of course, all of these have explicit <coughs> grants of power. So one can argue whether or not it's a, you know, it's a good constitutional decision in World War I to uphold the draft or not, as, a, as living out or kind of working out of the power to raise armies. But that's a pretty explicit power. It also goes to core governmental sovereignty, and all of these duties are to the government. These are not duties to buy private products. These are duties to the national government on matters of core sovereignty. <clears throat> the judicial system, military, counting how many people there are so we can have a Congress and a portion of Congress. These are very, very different from arguing that we can have kind of affirmative duties under the Commerce Clause. You know, it's again hard to imagine where one could stop if one allows this kind of a power. Now the second grounds that's been advocated in terms of allowing this to go forward, it's interesting, has not been accepted by any of the five district courts, which is the taxing power. Now, that doesn't guarantee that an appellate court or the Supreme Court couldn't decide suddenly, well, forget the Commerce Clause, maybe you're right, but this is simply a tax, so what do we care? Nevertheless, it is significant, I think, the fact that the three judges who upheld the law all dismissed this as a grounds for upholding the law. Very skeptical about this. Now, the Supreme Court has made very clear there are distinctions between penalties and taxes. In the case of LaFranca, they said that a, a tax and a penalty are not interchangeable, that a penalty is an exaction clearly, <clears throat> that if an exaction be clearly a penalty, it cannot be converted into a tax by the simple expedient of calling it such. And you can't just simply add the name on and say, well, it's different. But what's important here is Congress didn't even bother trying to call it a tax. Congress called it a penalty. I mean, Congress didn't go through any effort of kind of camouflaging it or baptizing with the taxing power because they thought they had it under the Commerce Clause. I mean, the President and Congress were very explicit, this is not a tax. I mean, a number of interviews the President made very clear, oh my goodness, no, this is not a tax at all. Congressional leaders were also very explicit, oh no, we're not raising taxes, no way. Legislation explicitly refers to it as a penalty. They call it the individual responsibility requirement. They asked the uh, you know, Congressional Research Service about this, and Congressional Research Service came back and said, you know, talked about it as a penalty, and kind of, you know, how it was a unique application of the law. Legislation does not list any revenue raised here as part of the revenue section. You go to the revenue section of the legislation, this doesn't appear at all. I mean, theoretically, they don't expect any revenue to be raised because the purpose of it is to get you to buy insurance, in which case you're not penalized. Moreover, it's not applied like any other tax. The IRS can't go after you and seize your home and throw you in jail for this. All the other taxes, federal taxes, they can. So it isn't treated the same way. And it says the individual responsibility requirement provided for in this section is commercial and economic in nature. Indeed, they went on and asserted the Commerce Clause justification for the legislation. So Congress is very explicit saying it's nothing to do with taxes. Never you know, mind this, because of course they didn't want to be attacked for raising taxes. So they went out of their way to say it has nothing to do with taxes. And the real problem here, of course, is if it works as it's supposed to, it won't raise any money. And the defenders of the law in court went out of their way to say this is absolutely essential and necessary for the act to work. Well, that's not by raising revenue. 
It's absolutely essential to work by penalizing people to force them to buy insurance. So if you're going to argue it's necessary for your regulatory framework, it's not necessary for raising money. The amount of money we raise is very small, you know, assuming some number of people fail to comply. It's necessary because they need a penalty to get you to buy insurance to back up <coughs> the mandate. You know, judge Vincent, the Florida judge who ruled on this case, said Congress should not be permitted to secure and cast politically difficult votes on controversial legislation by deliberately calling something one thing after which defenders of that legislation take an Alice in Wonderland tack and argue in court that Congress really meant something else entirely, thereby circumventing the normal accountability mechanisms of politics. I think what's uh, very important here is that Congress had every opportunity to call this a tax, structure it as a tax, treat it as a tax, at every point in the legislation and the political process they chose not to. The courts have said they, they're not likely to look behind a congressional assertion, assertion that something is a tax to decide that it's a penalty. Congress makes the assertion, it raises some money, they'll probably say that's okay. Well, flip that around. If Congress is going to assert again and again that it's a penalty, why should the court try to look behind that and come up with grounds to turn it into a tax? And there is a you know, court precedent saying, well, you can regulate, well, you can tax what you don't have the power to regulate, you cannot use taxing power for the purpose of regulating what you do not have the power to regulate. Drexel. And this is really what this case is all about. An attempt to use a nominal tax as a penalty for the purpose of expanding regulation over individuals and then ultimately go beyond that. Now even if it's a tax, there are real issues, the constitutional issues. It's not an income tax. While well, it's applied on income, the trigger is not income. So it really doesn't fit under the constitutional authority of income. So then you look at uh, you know, questions of whether it's an excise or a direct tax. Excises are supposed to be uniform. Direct taxes are supposed to be apportioned. Not at all clear you can kind of shoehorn this into any of those. Now, if a court decided it was a tax, maybe they would, because a lot of these doctrines are kind of old. And you know, typically, these days, courts have pretty much allowed Congress to raise money however it wants. Nevertheless, even if you think it's a tax, it doesn't necessarily easily fit into any of the categories that are constitutionally allowed. So that doesn't work very well. Well, then the next question is necessary and proper clause. Necessary and proper clause is really, I think, the, uh, the backup well, argument in terms of commerce clause. And the administration went out of its way in all of these cases to say this is absolutely necessary. I mean, the reason we have to have this mandate is it's the only way, only way this legislation can work. Absolutely necessary. Well, maybe it is necessary for this particular piece of legislation. That doesn't mean it's proper. Now, the necessary and proper clause, you know, is not kind of an independent grant of power. It's instrumental. It's, an, it's basically a mechanism to allow Congress to achieve legitimate ends. You know, it's limited then in that sense. Now, it was used in the Wickard case, the argument that you know, we have to go after these local farmers because of our interstate regulatory scheme. But again, it's going after people who are farmers, who have entered the marketplace, and where you have an independent argument in terms of commerce clause allowing you to reach those people. So it was not an independent grounds reaching people who otherwise couldn't be reached, but it was part of the commerce clause you know, argument. <coughs> Even Alexander Hamilton pointed out that it may truly be said of every government, as well as the United States, that it only has the right to pass such laws that are necessary and proper to accomplish, accomplish its objectives entrusted to it, for no government has a right to do merely what it pleases. So a necessary and proper clause cannot become a new grant of power that allows you to do anything that you want. By simply arguing, well, we want to achieve X, so it doesn't matter if this power has any authority, because we want to achieve X, we've got to do so. Indeed, it's kind of wonderful, if you think of this particular piece of legislation, what Congress does is passes a legislation that they acknowledge <coughs> will be a disaster if they don't have this one regulatory mechanism. And then they argue, even if we have no constitutional authority for it, you better allow us to use it. Because if we don't, there'll be a disaster. Well, now, are you allowed to bootstrap your way into this? You know, kind of you know, the threat of self-suicide, right? I mean, if, if you don't give me this, we're going to blow everything up and it'll be a catastrophe. Now, the point is Congress has wide power to regulate 
the insurance industry and healthcare. And that's the fundamental argument the administration has made. This is a huge multi-billion dollar industry, one-sixth of the US economy, lots of big problems out there. Congress has to be able to regulate it. Okay. But the fact that Congress has the constitutional power to in many ways regulate the healthcare industry, health insurance industry, does not mean that it can regulate it in any way that it wants. If they wanted to expand Medicaid, they could. If they wanted to expand Medicare, they could. If they wanted to mandate that every insurance provider provide free health care, they could. That doesn't mean they have the power to have a mandate that individuals buy insurance. Now, there's an irony in that. As some folks have argued you know, that anybody arguing this case you know, in terms of the constitutionality may very well come to rue the day if they win. Because right, if the legislation gets thrown out, who knows what Congress will do next. And I know folks, they'd much prefer to have single payer, they'd prefer to have expanded Medicare, etc. My reaction, maybe you're right, but that's not the issue we're fighting right now. I'll fight the policy battle later on in terms of what's the best way to try to fix health care. Current system's a mess. I'm not an advocate of the current system. But the point is, the constitutional question is, does Congress have the power to do this? The fact that it can do other things that might in certain ways seem more intrusive or more extensive does not answer the question of whether Congress can act in this particular way with this particular exertion of power over individuals. The answer is, is does not. You know, the fact that Congress can do other things doesn't tell you anything about whether or not you know, it can do this. In the recent Comstock decision, unnecessary and proper clause, laid out five. They're either tests or considerations. I guess we'll see in coming years how you know, the court treats that. Are they kind of necessary to be uh, you know, fulfilled? Are they merely things to think about as they're discussing it? But the question about do the means and end fit? You know, in this case, maybe. On the other hand, you know, traditionally Americans haven't liked financial exactions. They haven't liked federal mandates on national mandates on things like this. The question is, is it a long-standing federal activity? The answer there is clearly no. I mean, it fails that element of the Comstock uh, decision. Is it a you know an ext necessary extension of pre-existing practice? The answer there is no. I mean, again, this doesn't fit. Comstock case is a civil commitment case. But you know, there's simply no, nothing there in terms of past history to give the federal government that power. <clears throat> the question is, does it properly account for state authority? I think the answer is no. You know, again, it fails that, uh, that test here. The question of the link between you know, the means chosen and enumerated powers, again, I'd argue, fails that test. So if you look at the considerations, assume they're just considerations under Comstock, necessary and proper is not a very good basis upon which you know, to make this you know, decision. And again, the argument that it is necessary for this particular piece of legislation to survive does not mean it fulfills the necessary and proper clause. There's much more to that clause in terms of <clears throat> whether power is constitutional. Now, beyond this, there are a lot of other arguments that have been used by some critics of the legislation. You know, there's an argument on Medicaid. The question is, is the federal government coercing the states you know, by basically imposing you know, raising eligibility limits and uh, expanding the financial obligations. The problem with that, of course, is that states voluntarily enter into this. You know, so while, yes, it's hard to give up Medicaid, states like Texas are actually talking about that as an option. So it's rather hard to go into court and say, I've taken the money in the past, now I'm upset at the new conditions that are coming in. I don't think that one's going to be a winner. There are a number of other issues out there that have been argued, you know, under the, uh, you know, Privileges and Immunities Clause or Substantive Due Process, is there a right to health care? Does this violate a fundamental right to health care? I rather like that argument, but I rather doubt that the Supreme Court is going to entertain that and create a new substantive due process right and use that to invalidate this legislation. Randy Barnett, among others, has kind of made arguments you know, about kind of conscripting state officials and states. I mean, there are a lot of, I think, intriguing arguments out there that are very likely to find their ways into law review articles, and I think to enliven debate about a number of other doctrines. But it strikes me, when it comes down to it, and when this hits the Supreme Court, and I believe that it will, I'd be very surprised if the Supreme Court dodges it. I suppose that if all these other cases go to the appellate level and every appellate court you know, finds it's constitutional, the court might just say, oh great, whoosh, we don't have to get involved. But I'd be surprised. I think this is such a critical piece of legislation. Because what's going on here is both the question of how you try to fix the healthcare system, but it's also a question about whether there are any limits left on the federal government and whether or not the original Constitution retains any vitality in the sense of the federal government being one of only limited enumerated powers. So I'd be very surprised if the court you know, doesn't take this. If it goes to the Supreme Court, I think they're going to focus on the three issues of Commerce Clause, 
of taxing power necessary and proper. And these other things, if they get mentioned, will be in interesting footnotes. I mean, Justice Thomas did bring up the question of privileges or immunities clause in the McDonald decision, didn't get anybody else to bite on it. I think that's probably a good indication as to where this court is, that they're not terribly interested in trying to go out and chart new, you know, broad new constitutional terrain. They're going to take fairly traditional doctrines and try to figure out how do they apply to this piece of legislation. Now, the decision is by no means a done deal, but I think it's an extraordinarily important decision. The deal, you know, again, because we're looking ahead, I think both, I mean, if the legislation is thrown out, there's going to be a very different Congress and a very different political climate in which to address these issues, and they need to be addressed. I mean, again, I, I would move in a much more patient-oriented, market-oriented direction on health care, but the current system is a mess that needs to be addressed. If this legislation is tossed out, it will be a very different kind of climate in which to debate these issues. It's also going to be very important for constitutional doctrines in the future in terms of what is the authority of the federal government in a whole host of areas in coming years, whether it's nanny state activities, commercial regulation, and others. At that point, I'll stop here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the floor to Judge, Judge Vincent, is that right? Last week when he basically kicked the Department of Justice in the butt and said, you know, put it on expedited review or else. Is that tactically sound from the point of the people who want this bill overturned. And by that I mean, as you see with the D.C. judge who says now that the, the Commerce Clause can legislate thought. Should we, those of us who want it overturned, should we hope that it shouldn't be expedited because we're allowing people to continue to put their foot in their mouth when it comes before the Supreme Court and they say, Given what's been said, I can't believe our judges below us are actually saying this. Or by expediting it, are we narrowing the issue and then letting the Supreme Court do what they need to do? Which, I mean, how do you feel about that? See, in part, I guess my reaction is, you know, critics of the law don't have control over this. I mean, I think Judge Vin you know, what has happened with Judge Vincent, of course, is the issue of severability. Yeah. Judge Hudson, in the Virginia case, he ruled it unconstitutional, severed it. He said, I'm only tossing the mandate, I'm not touching everything else. I think Judge Vincent has a better argument because everything hangs on it. And if your litigants are coming into you saying, none of this can work without it, and there's no severability clause in the legislation, you know, that suggests that, well, gee, I mean, I mean, Congress would never have passed all the other stuff if they didn't have the mandate. I don't know what they would have passed. They would have passed something, but that, so I think there's an argument there that you should toss the whole thing. But I think that the argument for then Judge Vincent is, if you argue that it's, you, know, there's, you can't sever it so everything's invalid, then that would suggest the federal government needs to stop implementing it. Mm -hmm. Now the complication there, of course, is you have five you know, rulings you know, in different circuits around the country, four of which, I mean, three uphold the law, one voids it but says it's you know, severable. So you're the only guy who applies severability. Can you, do you apply that nation? I mean, you know, you have you know, conflicting ruling. I mean, Michigan is one of the states, you know, that's kind of sued, but the Michigan court upheld the law. So I think from Judge Vincent's standpoint, this makes sense, which is, look, I think that my, my ruling requires the federal government to stop implementing it. But I also recognize the complications. But those complications, if the federal government takes seriously, means they should expedite the appeal and move this forward. Because they're right, this is a difficult situation, and none of these district court judges thinks they're the end of the, you know, the matter. So I think that from that standpoint, Judge Vincent didn't particularly care about, you know, what best sets up the case when it, when it goes up to the right. And I, and I think you're both, on both of the, both sides of your argument makes sense. And I don't have any idea. Is it better to have this before the Supreme Court in the 2011-2012 term? Is, is it better to have it while there's an election campaign going on or not? I don't know. A part of it depends on what happens in the election campaign. I mean, I suppose, you know, if the Republicans sweep in 2012, maybe you prefer to have it before the high court in 2012, 2013, where the judges are happy to just, you know, junk this whole thing and let the new guys take it. I don't, but I don't know. I mean, trying to, so to my mind, that's one where, kind of mercifully, we can theorize what is best for our side, if you want to call it that, but we have no control over, in fact, what's the best tactic, I think, in that case. You talked about the idea that not choosing to enter a marketplace is 
you know, some people want to construe that as your choice not to enter is in fact entry. And I understand that in terms of wheat and cars and everything else, but isn't the idea that you don't enter the healthcare market a pleasant fiction? I mean, everyone eventually is going to seek healthcare. I mean, they want to say that, no, I don't need it. I'm just going to, you know, not go for it. But even if you didn't want it and you start having a cardiac arrest and somebody calls the hospital, they're going to pick you up in an ambulance and take you and charge somebody for it. And so it's one of those issues where you're going to die, your body's going to decay, and society's not just going to let you dip off without cost. Sure, but the same thing with eating, right? I'm going to eat. I mean, if I don't grow my own farm, my own products, I'm going to have to buy it from somebody. I have to enter the marketplace. If I don't have enough to buy it, we're going to provide me with food stamps. And yet we pay or act people for activities that are dangerous to themselves or other people, like not eating. It's a sign of insanity. So we should treat people who don't buy health insurance as insane? Wow. Um, I'm just saying that there, I see no difference in terms of the idea that you are inherently going to be part of the marketplace between eating, transportation. If I walk, I'm not using an automobile. If I'm not using an automobile, I'm using a bus. If I'm not, I mean, the problem is, how do we define regulation? Can we regulate health care? Certainly. But it strikes me that's not the constitutional issue here. Can the federal government mandate that you purchase insurance? So yes, you will be using health care. And indeed, I think you should have insurance. But the question is, constitutionally, can the national government mandate that you purchase insurance because we know at some point you will be using health care in some form or another. And some number of those people may need public support or something else. I think that, yes. And that, I mean, so there's a, there's a very good substantive argument, policy argument for what Congress did. I happen to think they went the wrong way and kind of more power to politics and political decisions on health care than personal. But I think, it, I mean, it's a, as a system, it makes sense. But it strikes me that's not really the issue here. The issue ultimately is does Congress have power in this instance to apply this particular exertion? And there I'd say no. Even though you're right. I mean, all, you know, all these, you know, if you don't buy insurance, you're still going to be part of the larger health care market. Judge Kessler's decision in, in Mean versus Holder is being categorized because the holding states that the legislation is valid. But if you look at her reasoning on the taxing, on the commerce clause, and necessary and proper, taxing she dismissed yes. as, with the other benefits. Commerce clause, she used the term mental activity. That is a check on the, on the side for, the, for repealing the legislation, in my opinion. The reasoning is so unsound. Necessary and proper, she used the free rider phenomenon, but then she didn't address EMTALA, the federal legislation that essentially creates a free rider yes. problem. So by ignoring EMTALA in her judgment, she opens up the door for someone on appeal to say, Yes, there is a free rider, so let's repeal EMTALA and eliminate the free rider. So it seems like that decision is, can be used very well uh, for the repeal side, as opposed to being categorized as you know, against repeal. Well, I mean, it goes back to the first question, which is, if you don't like the law, do you want more decisions like that? And I would say yes. Right. Um, now, if you have only one decision, I mean, you take the win. So if I, you know, if I want to sustain the law, I don't worry too much about all the... Because I look, the reality is Congress is probably not going to revisit whether or not it mandates that you know, hospitals care for people. Yeah, I mean, just that, so that free writing problem is still going to be there. Uh, but I do think you're right. I, I think that, I mean, if you're, if you're looking at the high court, I think that especially the rhetoric of mental activity is one that's going to give you know, both appellate courts and the Supreme Court pause because it does suggest kind of a limitless character of the authority that's being asked for. Uh, and I, I'm surprised that she used that rhetoric because to me it was unnecessary and it really did undercut her argument on appeal. Uh, you mentioned General Motors before. I, can you go over that argument again? I kind of missed it. I mean, if the federal government can come to you and say, you know, there's this huge impact in terms of economics, so you have to buy insurance, well, why can't it come to you and say, you know, the auto industry is going under, domestic auto industry? Your decision not to buy General Motors automobiles is why the industry is in trouble. Because of that, there are huge interstate economic impacts. The industry is failing, people are moving to other states, federal welfare payments are up, federal bailouts are being applied, money is going to the auto industry, it's in federal receivership, etc., etc. That if the argument is interstate economic impacts can force you to do something, even if you're not part of that marketplace, I don't see where the, why the principle doesn't apply to that, or Lehman, or kind of to kind of go down the line of other commercial enterprises. Yeah, on the other hand, they didn't mandate you to buy General Motors um, products or whatever. 
They gave them money. GM repaid all the money back, and they posted two quarters of two billion dollar profit of four point six seven. So obviously that did work out good for us. We got our money back, kept jobs. We haven't gotten it all back. And you know whether it's good or not to subsidize American corporations and create a moral hazard is an argument for a different uh, day. My point simply is, on principle, the federal government I mean, on health care can spend lots of money on health care. It can give people money. It can offer tax. I mean, it can do it again. The federal government has a lot of power to regulate. The question is, can it do it in this particular way? I'd say on General Motors, if you want to bail out the industry, they figured out how to bail it out constitutionally. I would argue they could not have a mandate on the American people for everyone to purchase a General Motors automobile. automobile in order to bail it out, that that would transgress the Constitution. Okay, so since this system is broken, and I, I'm not going to say whether this is legal or illegal, what is the fix? We all agree that health care is broken. How can we fix it constitutionally? Sound? Uh, constitutionally well, well the, sound to my mind, the most, of, what you've got to realize, I mean, oh boy, I mean, you know, I mean it's, a, it's a really, I mean, it's, it's a messy issue, it's huge. But basically, at the moment, 90%, it's a third party payment system, 90% of the dollars spent in health care in the first instance is paid by somebody else. So imagine that as your incentive system. And if that's the incentive system for automobiles, you could walk into an auto dealership, <coughs> point to a car, and you only had to pay 10%. Now, overall, you'd end up paying the rest of it through auto insurance or something. But it's not, I mean, what matters is at the margin what you spend. I can assure you, I would not be you know, driving the Geo Prism that I drive. I'd be driving a Porsche. I mean, I go in there and yeah, let me buy that $100,000 automobile because I just spend $10,000 on it. Why should I care? Now, that's a really perverse system, especially when you split decision makers and payers. So think about food. What if we had a system where we collectivized food decisions? You had food insurance. So you'd show up at a supermarket and choose the food you want. And you got it essentially for free because you paid a monthly premium. Now, do you go to the hot dog aisle? Do you go to the steak aisle? Do you go to the lobster aisle? You're not paying anything at the margin, or you're paying 50 cents per item or something. My guess is most of us would be showing up on the lobster and uh, you know, steak aisles. Well, then you can imagine costs will scream upwards, at which point they'll put in utilization controls. They'll go up to the checkout and say, oh, no, I'm sorry. You can only have steak twice a month. You've already hit your allotment. No, sorry. I have to put it back. You have to go get hot dogs. So suddenly you find your life micromanaged. Now it can be by government, it can be by private utilization review as part of insurance plans. I mean, it's an utterly insane system. So I'd say what you have to do is, number one, is you have to get rid of the current tax advantage to comprehensive care, comprehensive insurance. What you want is insurance, it's insurance, it's not prepayment of medical expenses. And you want to treat <coughs> salary the same as fringe benefits. So what you're doing is individuals choose their plans, not employers, not government. So you've got to deal with the tax system. A medical savings accounts is one way to get at the problem. We should have an interstate marketplace. You can buy policies across the country. We should eliminate state mandates. States tell you, you have to buy a policy that has a long list of stuff in it. Because every doctor's group shows up at the state capitol and wants their procedure covered. Pushes up costs, but they know if it's covered, insurance will increase demand. So you want hair transplants and a whole list of other things. Well, you shouldn't have to buy those. I mean, it, you know, it's a lot of small steps. There's no grand create this federal agency and boom, it's done. But it's instead of deal with the tax issue, deal with the problem of third party payment. It's going to be messy. It's not going to be easy. But that's the direction I would go. You want to emphasize patient choices as opposed to governmental choices. You mentioned that they were going to micromanage care. The private sector is already doing that. But that's what I'm saying. It's because of a system that separates the people who pay and the people who utilize. I have insurance, it's not really insurance, I mean, insurance for Viagra, that's not insurance. I mean, this is insane. I mean, this is nutty. I mean, I, I just want this, I mean, it's like you have auto insurance that covered every oil change. It's prepayment of normal maintenance. Think of how expensive that would be. You send in the receipts every oil change. You know, and every, every time you gassed up, the company would have to cut you a check. And they have to keep track of, you know, what your deductible is. And, oh, no, we have a 50 cent payment, you know, a co-payment on your... It'd be nutty. We have, we have auto insurance, which we choose. You know, an employer doesn't provide the policy. Government doesn't. We choose what's best for us. For the most part, it's for catastrophic. We have a car accident. You know, the fender falls off. I pay for it. 
You know, but if I have a car accident, then I'm covered. So, I'm, so the current system, you're right. I mean, it infects everything. The third-party payments system affects government and private, which we have a huge problem, where all the incentives are misdirected. But I mean, there's, you know, I mean, I have a whole talk I could give on that, but it's, I mean, it's really complicated. But I would argue you've got to move more in a patient power, <coughs> patient-oriented direction, which has changed the incentives away from a third-party payment system, which I think has really given us the problem. My, many of the, I mean, you're all, it's never going to be easy. It's never going to be a pure market activity. You know, you're wheeled in from a car accident. You're not going to ask for competing bids from anesthesiologists for your operation. You know, but there are a lot of places where individuals can make very important cost-effective choices. And today, we have an incentive structure that discourages it. And that permeates the system. Um, I tend to agree with Jake, actually. Um, I personally think that your comparisons aren't analogous to, to um, the healthcare situation. Find GM. By or, or making everyone a farmer is it, it is not it is not the same thing. And when when you talk about the necessary and proper cause, when you talk about what is best for the general welfare of the United States, it, it comes it comes to mind that we need to balance our budget because we we are in debt in this country, and this helps us. The CDO has already said on multiple occasions that um, changing the way we do our health care in this country um, allows us to balance our budget. Additionally, uh, preventive care, we know, helps uh, people stay alive and helps the citizenry. And, and with that, it drives costs down because people aren't coming to the hospital when they get ill or, or when they get sick for their health <coughs> healthcare expenses. Additionally, there's a, there, there are a lot of people who want access to health care, however, do not have access to health care. And this, is a, this allows them to have access to health care. 30, 30 million people in our country who don't have access to health care. People possibly sitting in this room who may have what we consider pre-existing conditions or what the healthcare care industry considers pre-existing conditions who don't have, who don't have health care right now. This is, this is not a purely, or this is a purely policy thing or a policy argument. It's also a moral argument and an ethical argument for our country. And buying cars and making everyone farmer because uh, our, our wheat industry is poor. Dave, I need to tell you do you have a question that you're going to get to? Yes. Uh, can you give a better analogy? Because your analogy is... Look, uh, the fact that you think that a particular, particular set of policies is moral tells you nothing about the constitutional authority behind it. Number one, preventive care does not save money. Preventive care actually costs money. Now, I think it's probably worth doing. They got into, you know, if you look a couple of years ago, big brouhaha over mammograms. Federal panel said women shouldn't have mammograms so often. Because, well, if you have mammograms, everybody gets them, so you pay for everyone. You get false positives, you treat people who don't have it, and you create unease because they think they have it. Now, I have no medical opinion on whether or not mammograms should be every year or not. But this shows the problem. Should they be every year or not? I don't know. But there's no obvious federal answer. And many preventive care, no, you talk to healthcare professionals, preventive care doesn't necessarily save money. It means everybody gets the treatment. Now, it may be good, but it's an investment and you're spending money. Now, the CBO analysis is based on a, a legislation that was written for the CBO rules. CBO analysis number one says the legislation will increase healthcare spending. That's, it will be higher than it otherwise would be. If you expand coverage for more procedures, demand goes up. Their analysis, you can go back, pull the reports off. Healthcare spending will rise. Now there are some cost containment things in there, things to try to reduce demand, but you take, on the one hand, expanding coverage against the stuff they're trying to do, comparative effectiveness and some other things. Put them together, costs are actually higher than they otherwise would be. That's the reality. Now, maybe a better system, because, yes, more people have health insurance. The problem, is there's a, the, the number is traditionally 46 million people. 10 million are illegal aliens. What you do about the undocumented workers is an issue, but it's immigration, it's not health care. 10 million of those people have three times the uh, you know, poverty income. For the most part, they're self-insuring. 10 million of those people actually are eligible for federal programs and are on them and weren't thinking about it when they answered the census question or have not signed up but are eligible. So the number of people who really don't have access, in and this is much closer to, say, 16 to 20, as opposed to 46, is still a problem. But the question is, how do you address that? And I agree it's a moral issue, 
But the moral issue isn't necessarily this kind of legislation. The big problem is, if you look at the numbers, the budget numbers, CBO runs a 10-year analysis. So Congress, congressional leaders know this, number one, we start the legislation in 2010 to collect revenue. We don't start spending money until 2014. That allows us to treat a six-year time frame as 10 years. So the cost is less than a trillion dollars. If you take it from 2014 out 10 years, it's a $2 trillion bill. Now, there are a couple of other problems with that. This includes a half trillion dollars of cuts in Medicare. No one believes they will ever be enforced. Back in 1997, Congress passed legislation to cut doctors' reimbursements to take effect in 2003. 2003. Every year, Congress has put it off, including the year in which they passed this legislation. So they are passing a bill to cut Medicare at the very same time they're passing legislation not to apply the cuts in Medicare they voted for a decade before. You believe these cuts are going to be implemented? They also double counted. They put out a Medicare report, trustees report, and said, we fixed Medicare, it's great. They have all these numbers, you know, all these numbers are down. I encourage you to go online, take out the st Statement of Actuarial Opinion, the last three pages of a 283-page report by Richard Foster, Chief Actuary of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Now, the Republicans didn't like him because in 2003 he told the truth about the cost of the Medicare drug benefit program. And I want to emphasize this is not a partisan issue. The GOP was utterly, utterly financially irresponsible. Indeed, if you cost out unfunded liabilities, the Medicare drug benefit is probably more expensive than the health care reform. So I, have, I hold no brief for Republican politicians. But Foster stood against the GOP then. He has a three-page statement of opinion, actual opinion. He says, number one, if you actually apply these cuts, fewer and fewer doctors will serve the elderly. So it is very unlikely these cuts will be carried into force because there would not be sufficient providers to provide the services. Because of that, he says, the estimates here are unreliable. That is, 280 pages of numbers are basically fake. He also points out, by the way, these numbers have already been counted against the health care reform. And you cannot simultaneously take your savings and expand health care coverage and fix the Medicare problem. Got one pile of money, goes one place or the other. They're trying to spend it both ways. And there are a bunch of other wonderful bits of ledger domain as part of this legislation. They count some Social Security revenues as part of going, you know, helping to balance the budget. They create what they call the Class Act, which is supposed to have a trust fund. So they spend six years collecting money for the trust fund and count it for health care reform when it's supposed to become part of the trust fund for a new program, which actually itself is actuarially out of balance. Ken Conrad, the North Dakota senator, Democrat, chairman of the budget committee, said this is yet another Ponzi scheme. So that's counted for health, plus a bunch of other things. And they don't count $100 billion of implementation costs and other things. It will increase federal spending. It will increase medical spending. Now, you can argue it's still a good thing, but that's not the constitutional issue. Congress has lots of ways it could address the issue of the uninsured. It could expand Medicare, make Medicare universal, single payer, any number of these things. What I'm arguing is the Constitution doesn't allow it to do this, which is why it's analogous to can Congress force you to buy an automobile to save the auto industry? Can it force you to buy insurance to save the health insurance agents, you know, industry? The answer is no. Now, maybe you might think that makes more sense than the other mechanisms, but that's not the constitutional issue. So that's a fairly long answer, but there's a lot as part of your question. You stole my thunder. I was going to say, why can't they just make Medicare at age zero instead of 65? I mean, that's, well, it still would be legal under the Constitution, correct? Yeah. No, I mean, the, the wonderful thing about both Medicare and Social Security is the way it passes constitutional muster is you have no legal right to it. So they spend money and they tax. Now, the problem with that, of course, is you have no complaint if they cut benefits. Look, the problem with Medicare right now is basically the, the I mean, to argue that Medicare works well, number one, has a $90 trillion unfunded liability <coughs> currently. $90 trillion. It's far worse than Social Security. That's benefits that are promised with no money to come in to pay them. So I don't know how we're going to work that. 
Um, it also has a very high fraud rate. And if you look at comparable claims in terms of payment, it is administratively no more efficient than private insurance. So, I mean, you, and today, I mean, the elderly have a much harder time finding doctors who want to take it because what it is is it's basically a fee-for-service program that has price controls. The New York Times had an article a couple of years ago talking about how doctors were recommending or saying, you know, if you're with a doctor and then you turn 65 and get on Medicare, they'll, they'll probably keep you. But if you show up in a new community and have Medicare and want to find a doctor, it's very, very hard. Because the payment limits have been ratcheted down, that's the whole question this doctor is fixed and why Congress hasn't applied this earlier cut, because it probably would be disastrous. The problem is the more you lower reimbursements, the less likely people are to want to serve. So the question is, if you put everybody in, can you lower it all and figure doctors will suck it up? Well, we have, you know, we have a problem now with primary care physician access. Uh, you know, Massachusetts has run into this quite a bit with the legislation they passed. So, there are a lot of unintended consequences here that simply kind of suddenly giving everybody Medicare. I mean, Medicare survives now for a number of unique reasons, but if you made it with everybody, some of these structural problems would explode, and you'd have to find ways to deal with them. So there, there is no easy, the problem here is there's no easy answer. There's nothing where you can just kind of check the box. Magically, everybody has coverage and costs go down. There is no, and I do agree, it's a moral issue. I mean, I, look, I mean, my dad went through a whole bunch of stuff. He died a year ago. I mean, these are very hard decisions. And who should have access to what? How much should you pay for? And how do you take care of people? None of these is easy. But we have to be very prudential, I would argue, in terms of how we address it, and recognize unintended consequences and the impact of incentives. Um, the you know, health care thing happens, <coughs> and, and citizen uh, gain health care under the, this federal uh, mandate. Well, would there be any penalties for doctors to turn away those with the federal health no, I mean the, well, the I mean the, the only penalties that apply today, I think, are to hospitals in terms of you know care. I don't think there's anything for individual doctors. I don't think this current legislation has anything. I mean, the, you know, I mean doctors make decisions every day on what they carry. I mean, some, you know, I mean some don't. I mean, real problem with Medicaid. I mean, poor people need coverage. Medicaid reimbursement rates are even lower than Medicare, which means doctors are even more reluctant to take them, which means you know, poor people are much less likely to have a primary care physician, more likely to show up in an emergency rooms. It's not good for the hospitals, it's not good for the poor person because they don't have continuous coverage. So, I mean, today, and I, I don't think that would change. It's that, you know, if you have federal government making more decisions, you know, applying to more plans, it'd be harder for doctors to turn. I mean, if more and more plans had lower reimbursement rates, say, as a result of the federal policy, it'd be harder for doctors to turn them down because they'd have fewer other places to go. I was just going to say, conceivably, you could see that after the plan is implemented, if it's sustained, and it goes into implementation, when people are covered 10 years from now, 15 years from now, under this new federal policy, they're going to ratchet down how much they're going to pay out because they've got to make the numbers work. They do it with Medicaid, they do it with Medicare, they'll do it with this. Even though you're covered, not necessarily. Well, see, that will be the challenge. I mean, every you know federal program, social program, has cost more than expected. The only one that didn't is the Medicare drug benefit, which is marginally less because they used kind of a competitive private structure. But if you look at the early estimates in the mid '60s for Social Security and Medicare payouts 20 years later, they're laughing. They're like a tenth of what was paid. You know, so <laughs> the likelihood of this set. You know, this set of kind of regulations, given how complex they are, how many changes they make, where it's very hard today to have any idea what the unintended, I mean, you know, policy, you know, companies are dropping policies for uh, parents with kids. Because basically the system, you know, it allows one to game the system so they can't get the money back. So the Congress just assumed they keep offering the policies and the insurance company said no thank you and drop them. You know, they've already given about a thousand waivers so far to requirements under the law. Because you know, companies were dropping kind of these mini med plans of like McDonald's for workers, you know, low paid workers and other things. And they're saying, oh, well, okay, well, never mind, the law won't apply. Well, never mind that. Well, I mean, you either, then you don't have a law left, or you eventually eliminate them and you still have to deal with the problems. So I think that's right. Over the longer term, you're likely to see much higher costs. And then the challenge how do you pay for it all? I mean, right now we're talking, we have a $1.65 trillion deficit. And 10 trillion dollars ready at least probably over the next decade and a 14 trillion dollar current national debt so i mean where did, where is the money going to come from in future years we have an extraordinarily financial problem which is going to affect all programs but especially healthcare because it's so fast rising
question? Did you have a question? Um, this will be the last one. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering if it does take effect. Um, my wife's a physician assistant, and we deal with this stuff a lot. And, I mean, I really don't even. There is, I, I really don't know why people don't address it more often, but I don't find it. I don't find any moral argument for for making my life work for free or government mandated less than market wage. With these arguments that um, that somehow if you treat people for I mean, she had, she's inundated with people coming in for prescriptions of ibuprofen because the government paid Yeah, them. because of the change in flex plan and stuff. Yeah. Um, and now her physician, now she's switched. It, it, made, it makes a horrible work environment. You end up having the least qualified doctors treating the poorest people because you know, the only people, either they're going to work for the government because they're immune from liability or the army or whatever. Um, and then you have the good doctors that now she's she can't handle the work environment she's in, so now she's going to a new position that doesn't even accept Medicaid. Um, my question for you is, does the Obamacare, if it does continue on, is there any way to get out of it as a, like a cash for service basis? Or can, I mean, is there anything in the legislation that's gonna prevent doctors from saying like, we're just not gonna take government funds. Are they gonna make it a, like a mandate for physicians to do this? Because I'm, the, community, the silent majority, as far as I'm concerned, um, is outright against all of I mean, you're right. See, the problem, it's one thing to talk, I think, about a moral duty to take care of people who are sick. And I think that's there. The challenge, of course, is what does that entail? I mean, does that mean, you know, I have a moral right to every procedure that I want at the highest standard of care or not? I mean, that's the, and the problem is we all want the best and we don't want to pay for it. You know, so the, the question, you know, you come up with a moral duty, exactly where does that reach? And the other problem is how do you implement it? I mean, the point is it's one thing to say we want to make sure people have care. It's another thing to start saying, well, providers should you know, do it for rates that we set for political purposes. And you're right. I mean, you know, I mean your wife should not be in a position where somebody decides, well, you, you, know, you can work for less. I mean, it's easy for you know, somebody in Washington to say, you know, is that a moral you know, position to take? Uh, I mean, there are, at the moment at least, you know, there's nothing in the legislation that would prevent you from operating outside of the system on cash. Now, with the mandate, you pay a penalty, but the penalty, I mean, one of the problems with it, the irony is the penalty is probably too low. They found that's a big problem in Massachusetts. You know, if you don't, if you don't have the penalty high enough, you just game the system and you don't pay it. You know, because, you know, it's easier for you to pay the penalty. It's lower than the cost of health insurance. Then if you can sign up anytime you want, you sign up if you're sick. So, you know, you could easily find a system, I mean, you know, if somebody wants to stay outside of the system, they'd simply write the check, essentially, to the IRS for the penalty and pay for everything in cash. I mean, there are business, like, doctors now who have essentially concierge services that only pay cash. You know, if you want to take the receipt and go and send it to an insurance company, they don't care. What they say is, we're not going to be involved in this hassle, because it lowers their costs. They don't have to have administrative people who send every piece of paper in. I mean, all of the, I mean, you know, you have to get authorization. You, know, you have to call, I mean, are these procedures a lot of those, you know, what's the, the, the list of drugs that can be prescribed? I mean, all this sort of stuff. Suddenly you toss all of that out, administrative costs drop. And you don't have to worry about the delay. I mean, you get paid. You know, I show up and get a service and I pay, as opposed to, you know, three months from now, maybe the insurance company will cut a check, maybe not. Maybe they'll cut it for only half and they'll have to argue, you know, that sort of thing. So doctors already do that. You know, the question is, what, I mean, how many, how much room is there? for doctors to do that, and how many people can afford that and are willing to take that kind of a, you know, a, a risk. Uh, and you could imagine if, it, if that really took off as an option, there would be pressure on Congress to try to stop it. You know, exactly how they would and what authority they might use you know, is you know, not so clear. Maybe up the penalty, I mean, they might try some other things. You know, but, but nobody gains from those kinds of wars. I mean, to some degree, you see this in a lot of nationalized systems. They almost all have escape valves. And typically, escape valves work for people who are rich or have influence. I mean, a year ago, the premier of Newfoundland had a heart problem. And the Canadian system didn't offer him the best, least intrusive option, so he flew to Miami. Now, the, there, the, you know, the, the health care system is run by the provinces. So he's literally in charge of the Newfoundland health care system. <laughs> Needless to say, some Canadians were offended by this. And his comment was, it's my health and my choice. And my reaction is, well, yeah, he's right. The question is, should he be the only guy who gets that? You know, I mean, shouldn't that be a choice, you know, uh, you know available to others, which obviously it wasn't. So, you know, all of these systems, the moment you have more political control, you're going to run into these challenges in terms of constraints over choice by patients, choice by providers, who makes these extraordinarily difficult trade-offs that will exist in any system.
you know, but if you make them politically, you run in, I, I would argue, to an extra set of problems in how they're made. Thank you.